Well, here we are one year later, and I'm about to hit the road and head up to Maine to finish up this dining table. Anytime I head out of the shop, I want to take quick stock of the tasks that I still have ahead of me and what tools I'm going to need to do it. The last thing I want to do is end up 500 miles down the road and not have all the tools I need to finish this build. Though, I will be only about 45 minutes from the Lee Nielsen factory. Honey, do you mind if I go to Lee Nielsen to... Well, it was worth a shot. The construction is pretty much done, but the one thing that I do have to do when I get up to Maine is install the breadboard in on the tabletop, and I'm going to draw bore that in place. So I need a series of 3 8 inch walnut pegs, and that's what I'm working on here, just riving them out, driving them through the dowel former, and I'll probably make, I don't know, 10 or 12 of them, so I've got plenty. Only going to need six pegs, but doesn't hurt to have a few extra. My toolbox is always stocked with a handsaw and backsaw, block plane and jack plane, some chisels, some layout and boring tools. I'll throw in a smoothing plane and a card scraper for finish prep for this trip as well. So in addition to the pegs, some screws for attaching the top, and my finishing supplies, I'm all set to hit the road. Well, wish me luck. Got a long drive ahead of me. My first step after being away from this table for so long is just to kind of assess it. How did it fare over the last year? And since I'm going to be rounding everything over and kind of distressing things a little bit, I just went ahead and took the opportunity to chamfer and round over some of the edges. Now I wanted to check to make sure there wasn't any wind. I found that the tabletop was flat, but just using my breadboards as winding sticks, you can see that it's a little high on the right there. So the smoothing plane on the trestle itself was enough to remove any of that wine and get the tabletop resting perfectly flat. Now it's time to move on to the breadboards. First thing I want to do is mark the center point of each of the three tenons on the end of the tabletop. I will always square a line back and then I need to determine where the hole needs to go so that it's in the center of the tenon mass. In this case I go back three quarters of an inch from the shoulder and I should be right center on the tenon. Now, of course, I'm just going to bore through. I'm using a 3 8 inch peg, so I'm using a matching 3 8 inch auger bit. And it's always a good idea to check that your bit matches the size of your pegs. That little tenon cutoff is just nice to prevent a little blowout inside the uh, groove itself. Any extra blowout could possibly uh, affect the fit of the breadboard as it goes on, and I'd rather not have to dig any of that out. And anytime I need a clean exit hole, I'll always build partway through just to the point peeks through and then finish the hole from the other side. Once I've got the initial holes drilled, I'm going to slide it back into place. And I want to use either an alignment pin or the same drill bit you used before, slide it into the hole and mark these holes locations onto the existing tenon. Then I need to create the offset. And you'll hear a lot of different opinions here. 
Some people can say you can go an eighth of an inch or three sixteenths of an inch. I think that works for kind of timber frame work. When you're working with traditional furniture and three eighths and quarter inch pegs, you go too far and you're gonna snap that peg. I have found that a sixteenth of an inch works just fine for just about all of the work I need to do. So I bring a ruler up and I set it up against the shoulder so that I'm somewhat square and I can gauge in the same line and I'll move in sixteenth of an inch. This actually works best with a scratch all but I didn't bring one with me. And I'll make a much deeper mark a sixteenth of an inch towards the ten inch shoulder. And that's where I want to drill my offset. Now in order for a breadboard end to work, you have to elongate the holes on the outer tenons. That center tenon, I'm keeping the hole exactly as it is at 3 eighths of an inch, and that's gonna lock the breadboard in place. But the outer two tenons, I'm widening by a quarter of an inch on either side, which is way overkill. It's a full half an inch longer in the peg hole. The key here, as I'm just using a rasp to elongate it, is to only elongate it across the width of the tenon and not make that hole any wider along the length of the tenon. That way you're gonna throw off the effectiveness of the drawbar. So just be careful here. In the end, I have this weird looking football shaped hole. Now I'm a belt and suspenders kind of guy. You don't really need glue when you're draw boring something, but I'm just gonna put a little glue only on that center tenon. Again, if I glue the outer tenons, it's gonna freeze the top in place and it won't be allowed to expand and contract as the temperature and humidity change. Now with that in place, I'll slide the peg in. I've slightly rounded the ends of my peg so that it snakes around that offset and the pegs go right in. Generally, you'll feel a little bit of resistance as it snakes around the offset, and then it goes in nice and smooth from there on. Now this breadboard in is really tight. I'm just gonna flush everything off with a smoothing plane, bring them flush to the surface of the breadboards. Now I can go ahead and saw the ends of the breadboards flush with the edge of the tabletop. From here on out, it's about prepping for finish. Grab your smoothing plane and get to work. I've got to clean up a lot of real estate here on both the trestle, but most importantly, the tabletop. Now I'm using number two common walnut here, so there's some defects here and there, and that was part of the design premise here. But it does throw the smoothing plane for a loop a couple of times. So get what you can, then grab your card scraper and work on those difficult areas. A couple of spots around knots, a couple of reversing grain areas that I just had to put a little extra attention into to smooth up nicely. Now once the tabletop is looking good, you want to make sure you hit those breadboards. You might have to do a little bit of work just to flush them up with the tabletop. I'll clean all that off and I'll call it a night. I'll begin finishing tomorrow morning. I'm using General Finish's Endurovar Satin for this table. It's a nice mixture of drying fast because it's water based and a nice balance of not coloring the wood too much. It adds a little bit of an amber hue, typical of an oil finish, but it still lets the natural beauty of the walnut shine through. I was going to spray this, but doing some test finishing back in my shop, I discovered that I liked the look of a brushed and hand rubbed finish for this particular style of table. In this first coat, the wood is super thirsty, so I just use a cheap foam brush and basically just flood the surface. There's not a lot of build at all here. Now what's cool about water-based finish is it's ready to scuff sand within a couple of hours of applying that coat. I'm using 600 grit sanding sponges here just to knock down any dust nibs and prepare it for the second coat. And here's the second coat. Again, same foam brush. If I end up with brush strokes, I'm not terribly worried about it, but the low viscosity of Endurovar levels out pretty nicely. And you can see that build is starting to come up after the second coat. It just looks beautiful. Of course, it's freshly wet. It always looks beautiful when it's wet. Now, of course, the trestle needs the same treatment. 
I'll apply coats and um, scuff sand in between and keep applying coats. Now after I scuff sand, I wipe down the surface with a clean rag to remove that white powdery residue you see. The next coat of finish will cover up anything that's left over of that powdery residue. Here you can see I'm applying the third coat of finish to the tabletop and you can see a little bit of that white powder from the previous scuff sand and how it just disappears when you apply the next coat over top of it. You just don't want a huge amount of it on there. Now on the final fourth coat of the top, I make sure that I'm taking long continuous passes along the tabletop. If I do end up with any brush strokes, I at least want them to look nice and consistent. With that final coat dried overnight, I'm going to reassemble the table, sliding the trestle in, dropping the wedge into place, and pounding it in until I hear the pitch change. Right there. I'll flip the table on on its show face in order to screw it in place. And I'm just using lag screws here and elongated holes in the trestle so it can expand and contract on the trestle base. Now I can flip it up and step back and admire what I've built. Well folks, I'm done. Stick a fork in me. This table came together absolutely brilliantly, and I'm really glad that I was able to let the natural character of this number two common walnut shine through. Instead of going through an artificially distressing process and just relying upon the knots and the defects, if you will, in the lower grade lumber, I ended up with a beautiful table. A little bit of extra work on the corners to kind of round them over, add a little bit of age and wear, and I'm left with something that I'm incredibly proud of. So uh, I'm ready to celebrate. Somebody put on the lobster.